this week we have <sighs> gotcha again. A movie. Wow, it's a great <laughs> movie. It is. Um it it was it was pleasant pleasantly pleasing, I guess is the way to put it. Because it was good, no shortcomings. Um uh, uh, in, fun to watch. High praise. Well, I mean, you know, we get these little dips. We've had a couple. I know. We've had a couple dips where it's. <sighs> yeah, you know we've had I mean. a couple of, a couple of stinkers lately, but not this one. No, no, this one. Uh, yeah, it's it's a lot of good stuff that we talk about in this. Uh, just in, in not just the subject matter, but of course, you know, the technical stuff. Yeah. Um, really, really well done. And uh yeah. Yeah. I'm just so happy. I know. <laughs> Listen to us, we're just flabbergasted. We don't even know what to say. Well, I mean it was getting a little worrisome there. It was you concerning know. for a moment. We we've, we've had we've had stretches where we've hit this like dry spell on good films. And then when we watch stuff, not for the show, just stuff that we randomly pick for background burner stuff, oh, that also is, <laughs> it just compounds. I think the most recent one of those we watched not for the show was Dinosaurus. Yes. Woo, woo boy. Um, pure 60s schlock. Absolutely. And, but wow. we did, and it would have not been so bearable had it not been the Rift Tracks version. That's true. So we kind of lucked out. They do make terrible movies bearable. They, they well, I mean, that's the whole point. Yeah. Let them spend the energy ripping on it. We can just kick back. Be lazy. That's true. Yeah. But we weren't lazy with this one. We took our notes. We did our stuff. We, we had talked talk. about it. We pulled <laughs> lessons. It had yeah. good lessons. Stuff we haven't actually touched on in a while, which is great. Yeah. Yeah. So. Ah, we flexed <gasps> and it feels good. Yeah. All right. I think we learned that we're almost adults. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, that comes up in the conversation. <laughs> There's a little more to it than that, but yes. Yes. Okay. Well, we don't have any, any uh, opening announcements, I don't think, other than we ran out and got slushies. Yeah, I see. Slurpees. Yeah, Slurpees, not slushies. Seven Eleven. Yeah. I'm not going to get into that whole big thing. But yeah. It's a bit of a haul to get to a 7 Eleven from where we are. A time honored sugar bomb. Yep. So those bad boys are sitting out there on the counter waiting for us. Waiting for us. Well, let's. Jump into this episode so we can get our Slurpees. All right. I think it's coming up. Let's go. Hey there, B-Siders. Welcome to another episode of Bob... Oh, my God. Of Bravo for the B-Side... Well, I'm this glad, is Danny. I'm glad you won. And this is Jim. And we are your very <laughs> tired hosts for this episode of B-Side. Oh, it has been <laughs> a wild 48 hours. Yes. Oh, man. <sighs> well, we do, I mean. We do have a movie to talk about. We do. But first. A quick recap. Over the last 48 hours, <laughs> we played a a. a 10 hour long session of D&D and then we ran a lot of errands in preparation at, for sending our child off to yeah. Georgia for a couple of weeks with grandpa and grandma she's there now and living it up punch. yeah yep. just getting her a little butt spoiled <laughs> um, so yeah we had that 10 hour session of D&D packed ran errands did all that stuff Woke up this morning at 3 a.m. to, well, really more 2:30. like 2.30. Yeah. Yeah. To uh, gather everything and get the kit shipped off. It has been a wild day. We took a little bit of a nap earlier today, but not much of one. No, it's 
pales in comparison. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's been, it actually started Thursday because you guys had that. Oh, good Lord. That's true. Thing. Well, not really bingo thing. That's coming. The meet and greet. Yeah. And that was busy. And, and then, Willie came and helped me with it. Yeah. And Friday before the D&D. I was very, very busy at work. Cause, and we did the tour at the Milestone And then school. you had the, yeah, the charter school tour. Yeah. And then had to rush back. And I was doing dinner and trying to get my work done. And, and ended then, up eating at my desk at home. I ended up eating at my fucking desk. At home. <laughs> while working. Yeah. <laughs> so that when you got home, we could get set up quick and then, yeah, play D&D for a long time. Until like four in the morning. Yeah. And then we slept for a little bit, woke up, did all the packing, running around, trying to find a dumb travel bottle. Seriously. One, one single travel bottle. I know. I know. But we did have a good dinner. Oh, we did. Yeah, it was yeah. wonderful. Right. It was a like pre-Father's Day dinner and a Lily going away dinner. Yeah, I just looked at it as a Lily going away dinner because we just let her pick wherever she wanted to go. And she's like, I want steak. I'm like, well, these other restaurants then aren't. <laughs> aren't going to do it for you. So we went out for steak. Yep. And yeah, it was, it was all good. It's mm-hmm. just been rushed. She's a trooper because, you know, she planes really supposed is. to take off and somebody had some pseudo was medical, a medical emergency. emergency, which wasn't a medical emergency, but you know, they got to do their <laughs> thing. Anyway, she made it. Yes. Grandpa picked her up mm-hmm. and all is well yes. in the midges universe. We've received very little communication from her today. Sporadic. Right. Occasional text. She texted me when they landed, which I asked her to, which was nice. And then later texted me a picture of grandpa to prove that she was with him. <laughs> I think. Well, while you guys were waiting at the gate, I'm sitting there because they only, when you do unattended. Yeah. They only let one parent go through security and up to the gate with them and wait. So I'm always sitting down in the, the normal waiting area on the first floor and I'm just sitting there and I'm actually just watching some YouTube videos and, you know, got my little earbuds in all of a sudden, bling, and there's a picture of my daughter <laughs> with, <laughs> with, a uh, uh, apple fritter, uh-huh. a cup of coffee mm-hmm. sitting, sitting in a massage chair <laughs> and just looking towards the camera like, Hmm. <laughs> Yep, that's about right. <laughs> she just lives it up. Well, yeah, she always asks me if she can do those massage chairs, and I'm always like, well, no. But this morning, it had been such a long, like, end of the week, prepping for the weekend. Yeah. We had to wake up at, you know, we had to wake her up at 3 a.m. Well, this was, yeah, and this was her first time flying in a few years. Yeah. Because of COVID. Last year, we drove. Yeah. Drove her down and then took our own little mini vacation mm-hmm. um, down there. But yeah, this is the first time in a few years that she's flown. And she's right. just all whatever. Yeah. But yeah, she had to get up for a red eye. She was tired. She was grumpy. You know. Drank half of my <laughs> my iced coffee. We made some iced coffee or cold brew, not iced coffee. Yeah. There's a big difference. There is a big difference. Mm, made our own cold brew. So delicious. So I had my Starbucks thing full of it. By the time you guys went up, it was more than half gone. So while I'm sitting down there waiting, I'm like, oh. Well, that that didn't last long. I had one sip of that. I know you had two. Oh, oh, two small right. sips. Yeah, yeah. No, she, which is fine because you know couldn't give her any to take through. Right. Oh. So anyway, yeah, we're still here. We're still alive, and we're doing this podcast. And well, judging from the, how it started, this is going to be a trip. It's going so well so far. It is fantastically. Yes. Well, we have a cool movie. We do. Um, again, in keeping with our women in film, uh, we have uh, one that's written and directed. And this one was I'm just going to say it enjoyable. <laughs> We've yeah. had a couple that haven't been so great. And then, you know, with this podcast, that happens. Well, everything right? that happens. So let's do a little comparison, right? A couple of days ago, I said, you know what? I wish we could do Detectorists as an episode. Yeah. It's not indie. It's not B. It's not anything, right? It's just a UK series. 
but it's it's the most magnificent example of a study in characters. Every time someone hits the screen, Fantastic. You're, you're immediately identifying with them. There's zero exposition. We know almost nothing, nothing about these people. They are on paper as two-dimensional as you can get, right? But you identify with them. Mm-hmm. You, you're just, you feel like you know them. It is so wonderful. And they're also starkly different. And nobody gets this large time on screen to establish themselves, right? Yeah. It's just so wonderful. Now, in contrast to that, let's talk about Lovecraft Country. Okay. So we've rolled through everything except the last episode. Yeah. Um, We're so, a little late to the game in, for Lovecraft Country. Right. Now, initially we liked it, but then we're kind of mystified, like, man, that seems like a whole lot of things we were expecting this to be about, like we're <laughs> done up in the first episode. Right. It's like, wow, he's dead. They just figured this and that. Huh. Well, then what are they going to be doing? Um, I have decided for myself, even though we haven't seen the last episode, because I don't like being nine episodes in on a 10 episode run, still not knowing what, what's the point. They have just gone every, we have two episodes that could have been completely axed, lent nothing to the movement of the story or character development or anything. And I'm still trying to figure these fucking people out. It's that whole thing of, it's yeah. sort of like the fad when this was done. It still kind of is. Your character is an asshole. He's likable. He's an asshole. He's likable. He's an asshole. He's likable. Well, either make him a likable asshole, right? Yeah. <laughs> or pick one of the two, you know, merge them appropriately. But I just, I, I don't know who I'm rooting for because they're just, yeah. I, and I'm not even sure what I'm, I don't, I honestly, I don't know what the fucking end game is supposed to be. I don't know what I'm supposed to be looking for. I don't know. They all have these things working against each other. I don't know who logically I should look at and go, oh. I hope they win. I hope this one wins. Yeah. Or even on an emotional level, emotionally, like intellectually, mm-hmm. I know this one should is right, but we, we do that with characters. Emotionally, I don't care. I want them right. to win. I'm just not attached to anybody. I, I, I mean, like Atticus, I feel for him, but yeah. I don't know what his, I don't know what his end game is. He's also kind of an asshole. Off and on. There we go. Yeah. Right? Um, every one of them is just horrible people. More often than good, right? They all like fend for themselves. They all turn on one another. Yeah. I just, I don't know. I don't know. But anyway. Anyway. There's a good example of like high budget, high end stuff. We have actually, Detectorist wasn't high budget. Nothing at BBC is high budget. (laughs) Yeah. They're, They're pretty frugal. They get shit done for miraculously small amounts of money. Um. But, and then you have HBO, you know, behind Lovecraft Country. You know there's a boatload of cash there. Mm -hmm. Like Scrooge McDuck swimming pools of it, just swimming through. Oh, yeah. And I I would hold detectorists up against this uh, in any category, right, for a series. Um, Especially the writing, direction, everything. Uh, It's just, you just don't know. You get one good and one's like, hmm, should have been, but... uh, Anyway, that's what we've run into. Yes. But not this film. This is a fun one. This was super clear from the start. And it was fun. It was legitimately fun. And there's some things we'll talk about that uh, made it not just fun, but accurate, relatable, everything. All right. Should I tell us about this thing? Yes, please. All right. So this week we are talking about Almost Adults. It was done in 2016. Uh, director is uh, Sarah Rotella, written by Adriana Di, Di, Di Leonardo. Jesus. <laughs> Ladies, I'm so sorry. And I'm not going to try it because it's just going to get worse. We've been up <laughs> since 3 a.m. And it's 8 o'clock at night right now. I know. Uh, starring, oh, man. Natasha. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Natasha Nagavanlis. Elise Bauman, Justin Gerard, or Gerard, depending, uh, and Winnie Clark. It has a TB14 rating. I'm just going to go ahead and say that is wholly inaccurate. 
<laughs> folks, because um, we were going to let Lily watch this with us. Because we we're like, oh, we read the premise. We saw the thing and, you know, TV 14 stuff. I'm glad we didn't because there was a lot of stuff there that is just slightly above that fort. This well, is not I don't stuff. Know. It was a lot of implied stuff, but I would say it was that- implied. Holy shit. They did everything but do the things physically. There was such description in some of this stuff. It just, it, it is not TV 14 okay. uh, to be messed up on that. And that, that happens. We, we, cause we found a TV 14 and I'm like, what country do 14 year olds get to see this? I mean, it was like soft porn. Remember well, that? it wasn't, uh, it wasn't we didn't even TV it. 14. It said that on IMDb also. So it must've aired on a television channel at one point. Or maybe not just picked up a rating. Sometimes IMDb. Remember IMDb is not an authority. That's it's a volunteer. And right. it's like a wiki. Yeah. Right. So someone might've grabbed it or the filmmakers were like, oh, someone gave us a TV 14. Let's run with it. Anyway. I would say you need to watch this first before you let your younger people watch it. That's all I want to say. Uh, so we had a budget of 122,056 Canadian. Mm-hmm. This was a Kickstarter or Indiegogo? Kickstarter, fully funded through Kickstarter. Right. They had a 40,000 goal, a 40,000 Canadian goal. Initially. And then and it, they got, stretch gold it. Yeah. Uh, I'll just say it does show. Oh, yeah. So the plot for this is it's a film about growing apart when growing up. Two best friends, uh, two, two best friends' relationship strains when one deals with her newfound sexuality and the other breaking up with her long-term boyfriend. I want to caveat that. It's inaccurate. It's not newfound. She's known for a long time, but she has been on the path of outing, coming out, right? Um. Yeah, funded through Kickstarter, and the, yeah. the two the two women, the writer director pairing, right? Uh, they run the Gay Women Channel on YouTube. When they've done right a whole bunch of shorts, various things, and this was their first uh, feature film. Well, let me just say. We typically don't like to do this up front, but, uh, you know, uh, Adriana, Sarah, if you're listening, anyone who starred in it, we don't want to keep you in suspense. Yeah, nailed it. <laughs> this was. It's real good. And there's so many good lessons here. There are. There's so many good lessons. Uh, speaking of. Yeah. Why don't we uh, roll into this bad boy so we can get to the lessons eventually. Okay. Take us away. So uh, we start off with a woman. She's waking up with someone's hand in her face. And she turns to see another woman, uh, Cassie, her friend Cassie, who they're just waking up. And Cassie says she just came in to cuddle. <laughs> uh, they're roommates. And so they're they're talking a little bit. We're establishing kind of like their friendship with each other is very close, very comfortable. Cassie snuck in because she doesn't like sleeping without Matthew. And Matthew is gone. So they argue a little bit about who should make breakfast. It's all this like very cute friendship stuff. And then we get a homage of them. Homage. Uh, God. Today is just not my day. Disclaimer. This is not going to be our finest episode. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God. But we're going to do it, damn it. And then we get a montage of more friendship stuff. Them going about the town. They're at a fountain. They're on a bench. They're eating ice cream. And then uh, we have a series of kind of like cut scenes between them at dinner. So the girl who is yet unnamed, I hadn't yet figured out her name. Same here. Is at dinner with her parents. And they're talking about like vegans and lesbians like she keeps trying to bring up lesbians like aggressively so right they're well they're in like a small hipster yeah restaurant i want to call it a diner right it's like just a um we've seen those places just above a coffee shop and her parents are super cute they're trying to be like very hip and she's extremely annoyed with them they know 
that they're trying to be. I and know. They're just playing it. I just, I love them so much. It, it's kind of like they're <laughs> fucking with her. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> they're us as parents. Um, and then Cassie is talking to her parents and they're in this like upscale kind of place and she's very like dressed up. Yeah. Um, and they don't know that she isn't with Matthew anymore. And boy, do they love Matthew. Oh, my God. Yep. I mean, yeah. They just go on and on about him and how he's a doctor. And and Cassie keeps trying to say, well, if 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 he graduates. He'll be a chiropractor. He'll be a chiropractor. And they're just like, you know, that it, they remind me of the old 50s movies and stuff where the parents are like pushing the, the, their daughter. You know, he's a brain surgeon. Mm -hmm. That's who you want. Love's not part of the equation. He's got money and stability. Right. And a house with a fence and a kitchen. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever, man. He's their dream son-in-law. Clearly. So back to the unnamed girl who aggressively tries to bring up lesbians again. And then we're back to Cassie, her parents being awful some more. And then we go back to the unnamed girl who is telling her parents that she's gay. Well, at this point, her name is Mackenzie. Oh, I didn't get that yet. Did catch that. So uh, she fi she's been trying all night. She finally gets it out that she's gay. And her parents freak out. Right? Her mom's like, how could you do this to us? And then we cut back to Cassie, uh, who's finally telling her parents that she and Matthew bro broke up. And they freak out. Yeah. How could you do this to us? <laughs> <laughs> well, when, when Mackenzie says, I'm gay, her mom goes, how could you do that to us? Yeah. Right? And then we cut away. Cassie's confession. Yeah. And her mom literally starts hysterically sobbing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so then we go back to Mackenzie and her parents and they're laughing now. Yeah. And she's pissed. They're, they were joking about freaking out. They, they knew already. Yeah. Her mom's like, honey, we know. <laughs> <laughs> we're not blind. Right. We're aware. Oh man. We uh the um yeah. And then we cut back to Cassie. Her parents are not joking. No, they are not. No. Uh they're legitimately like just having a mental breakdown over this. Did yeah, uh I, what settles these these relationships between the parent what these women are growing up with. Right. Right. Um Mackenzie's parents are super cool. I think because we identify, because we fuck with Lily all the time. Oh, constantly. You know, she is so battle hardened <laughs> <laughs> because of it. And she gives as good as she gets now. Oh, she does. You know. Uh -oh. And she also knows enough, like when we're occasionally when we're messing with her, uh, she'll be like, are you fucking with me? Yeah. Or are well, you being serious well, right now? And it, it backfires on us when I we know. are being serious. She she's like, you're, you're you're fucking with me. We're like, no, we're this is no, this is the real deal. We're explaining. <laughs> no, no, no. She's like, and she'll pull out her phone without even looking away from us. I know. <laughs> and like memory type in to double check us to fact check us. <laughs> um, but the one thing I wanted to to get out there is while that's all going on. Cassie's mom actually asks her, are you a lesbian? You remember that? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I just, because I noted that it, it's not the stupid words that got to me, but I actually figured out what it was. It was, it was like a parent would ask their kid if they were a Nazi. And that's not, not to be joking. It was with that level of like disgust and everything right. like the only worst thing that could happen yeah and i i thought two things one that was brilliant i don't know how many takes it may have taken but they fucking nailed it but two it actually made me physically ill yeah just in that and we're like 10 minutes in <laughs> so we go back to Mackenzie and her like very chill parents who are like uh is cassie your lover <laughs> right yeah 
Uh, and she's like, no. <laughs> I mean, legitimate questions. Right. You know, they're, they're best friends. They've been inseparable forever. And we know this already. This, you know, not very far into the movie, right? And then her parents confessed that they were worried she was going to tell them that she's a vegan. As she's sitting with like a plate of nachos in front of her. Yeah. <laughs> so later, Mackenzie is talking to a guy. She's FaceTiming this guy uh, about coming out to her parents. And she's very upset that they were so blasé about it. <laughs> and so like accepting and he is not very sympathetic to her in her pain, her plight of her parents just accepting that she's gay. Yep. Um, she, I, I guess she was hoping for a little more drama, right? Yeah. Well, he does try to check her by saying, yeah. oh. My parents don't well, I guess your parents, hell. Yeah, your parents don't care about you. <laughs> My parents do because they told me I was an abomination. When I came out. Right. And I'm like, ooh, there's a little bit of a little slack there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then we hear Cassie coming in and Mackenzie is frantically trying to shut off the lesbian porn that she's been watching, <laughs> which has been playing very loudly in the background while she's talking to this guy. Yes. Uh, and this was where I learned her name, <laughs> Mackenzie. Uh, and Cassie is not even like, phased about the porn she doesn't even ask about it Mackenzie just starts over explaining why it's on yeah a woman's study assignment right yeah it's for a class um and the big thing here is like they're chatting for a bit and Mackenzie is is struggling about coming out to Cassie because uh the guy she was talking to on the phone asked her parents asked and she still has not told Cassie. Right. Um, so later, the the two girls are laying outside together and talking about how their lives aren't how, like, haven't turned out how they thought. Uh, we learned that Cassie left Matthew because he proposed. Mm -hmm. And I guess she wasn't ready, you know, to figure that kind of stuff out. Shh. It, it broke her. Yeah. Because we get that she had a life list. Mm -hmm. One of those. This yeah. is what I'm going to do. She's very type A. Yeah. But in early 20s, right, between 18 and 23, right, most people, their life lists and stuff just gets flushed down the toilet. Yes. Because you, you actually, you know, just because you're 18 doesn't mean you're mature. Right. Right. But in that 18 to 23 range, the body matures, the brain matures, different chemical compounds. You start thinking differently and you start questioning. And she always thought she wanted that. But moment of truth. Right. Um, <laughs> maybe not. Yeah. It's a big thing. And then um, Mackenzie is like beginning to try and tell Cassie that she's gay. And then Cassie sort of... Uh, interrupts and what she thinks Mackenzie is trying to tell her is that she's made a huge mistake. So she has another little breakdown about that. And Mackenzie then decides while they're talking about this to not tell her at this moment. Right. I get it. The moment has come. The moment is gone. It's sidelined. Uh, so later Mackenzie is with Levi. He's been, the, he was the guy on the phone. Uh, who is asking uh, wardrobe choice advice. And while they're sitting there, he ends up getting her on Tumblr. And he's like, you got to have a selfie. So he's like trying to take pictures of her and it doesn't go well. No. He's just like, oh, these are all terrible. He's he's great, by the way. Yes. Um, the, the first physical introduction to him is wonderful. He, gra he, he goes through her phone, grabs a previous picture, does some touching up and editing, you know, cuts her out of it. Cuts Cassie out of it. Yeah, and it's all good. Then he asks how Cassie took it uh, when she told her that she was gay. Mackenzie said she didn't tell her. And he asks what she's waiting for. It's like, Cassie won't care. And Mackenzie is worried that something might change between them. It's, you know, and Levi's basically just trying to say, you know, it's worse that you're lying to her about it. Right. <laughs> so, uh, 
Later, Mackenzie's watching sports. Can I? Oh, go ahead. Put one thing in here. Yeah. One thing I wrote in it because you we had a whole discussion about this. Uh, he says, "I'm sure she already knows you're a hundred footer." Oh yeah, which is something Mackenzie's parents also have said to her when she came out to them. Yes, they said you're a hundred. You know, we already knew you're a hundred footer, and both you and I were like, "What is this? What does that mean?" Yes. <laughs> so we looked it up. You looked it up. And it is someone that you can tell their sexuality from a hundred feet away. Which okay, so it I, we neither one of us made the connection, I mean, right? You know, we every we we've grown up with the phrase, "Oh, I can see that from a hundred feet away." Yeah, see that from a hundred feet away. I never heard it worded in that fashion or used in that fashion. You're a hundred footer. I've never heard it as an adjective. Right. I you never know. have either. I saw that from a hundred feet away, you know, <laughs> and it's the same thing as I saw, you know, I could see that from a mile away sort of thing. It's just, yeah, I just never thought, but yeah. So we learned something. We did. Yes, we did. <sighs> so anyway, Mackenzie is watching sports and out loud wondering why lesbians like it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Cassie wants her to go close shopping and she's like, reluctantly she goes. Uh, when they're there, Mackenzie's bored as hell. And she ups her bribe requirement from pretzel, uh, pretzels to a cinnamon bun. Right. And then, uh, so they grab some stuff. Cassie goes into the dressing room. She's trying stuff on. And then Matthew comes in uh, with another woman who is also trying on clothes. It's pretty awkward. As they're talking to Mackenzie, and then Cassie steps out of the dressing room. Um, and then she sees the woman who, right? Oh my God, this is. She's very snobby. Not even snobby. She's just a horrible creature. <laughs> just awful. She's just. Uh, so she's wearing a dress, and she asks Matthew, Do you think anyone would fuck me in this dress? Right. Do I look fuckable? Yeah. And then she turns around to Cassie and says, oh, honey, no one's going to fuck you in that dress. Um, so Cassie drags Mackenzie into the dressing room and they end up hiding out there until Matthew and his hag leave. Uh, then Cassie is being talked to about a D on an assignment. Yes. Yeah. Her professor, Dr. Reese, tells her that if she bombs another, she won't be graduating in spring. So that's kind of a little bit of a wake up call. He sort of brings up, I've heard about the Matthew thing, da, 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 but bottom line is, you know, you got to grow. And I loved how it wasn't said, but the, the angle was, you know, uh, you just got to grow the fuck up. That's life. This is important. Right. You don't get to, oh, my boyfriend broke up with me. Nobody gives a shit. You've got to do what you've got. Or to I do. broke up with my boyfriend. Or, yeah. Well, yeah, we know that, but her narrative through the whole thing is that he dumped her when she tells people. And I was like, well, yeah, my boyfriend dumped me, but what do I know about being sad? Oh, I don't know. I guess I didn't pick that up. Oh yeah. Yeah. Multiple times. Huh. Yeah. Anyway. Anyway. Um, so while this is all going on, Mackenzie's outside uh, eating her lunch on a bench uh, when a woman comes up to her. And she says that her teammates had bet her that she could not get Mackenzie's number. So they, there's this all, I didn't, you know, there's all this kinds of chat. She ends up giving the woman her number. And this was the weirdest fucking thing. It's so weird. <laughs> I, I have a hard time fitting this puzzle piece into the, the grand puzzle. But I will say it's one of those rare occasions where I loved it. But I love it. It makes too. no fucking sense. <laughs> so anyway, Cassie's at work. Her internship. Or her intern. Well, it's, you know, still yeah. work. Yeah. Uh, but she's an intern. And then one of uh, those annoying co worker supervisor types that are just. Hey. hey! And they are so PC and current vernacular. Like if, if the, the book of business vernacular changed tonight at seven o'clock, by tomorrow morning, they'll have all the new. Right. They won't say anything they used to say. It's all this new stuff. And it's just so fake and annoying. And, oh my gosh. How are you? Yeah. And makes you want to quit any place you walk into. 
when this person comes up to you, like, nope, nope, gotta go. So anyway, she starts giving her shit about Cassie not signing an email to a client, kindest regards, and says the, the boss boss is like pissed off or something. And then goes off and then comes back. And I wasn't clear on the time. This was like shoo, shoo, in off, in off, in off. Well, Cassie, as she's like, Cassie is like, are you fucking with me? Yeah. She's like, oh, maybe. Uh, it's probably not a big deal, yeah. but maybe. Yeah. And then she comes back and sits down next to her and says, oh, I bet you, I don't think you've gotten the email. You're fired. And then helps her find the email. <laughs> and then and tells her she still has to stay through to get them lunch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it was so weird. And then later, she comes back. She comes back and spitefully shows Cassie Mackenzie's blog. <gasps> Isn't this your friend? Is oh she single? Just, I hate this woman so much. Oh, anyway, finally, we're finally out of that nightmare. Um, at home, uh, Cassie busts in on Mackenzie, angry as shit that she had to find out. Well, she busts in while Mackenzie is practicing telling Cassie. Yeah. Right? She's yeah. practicing to herself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and that didn't work out. So, yeah, she comes in and... Uh, uh, she asks, you know, why Mackenzie didn't tell her. They have this really weird argument. And Mackenzie says it's not about Cassie. It's about her. You know, it comes out that Cassie is the last to know behind everyone, including the Internet. Uh, Mackenzie says she was the most worried about telling her that's why. Right. Um, Cassie says she should be the person who Mackenzie comes to with important things like that. And then says, if she can't tell her things like that, they shouldn't be friends anymore. Now, let's just pause a second. Um, that's a valid argument on both sides. Yeah. And we discussed this, right? Yeah. Um, they both have valid emotions about the situation. Well, it is. And it's, it's, it's one of those things where not one side can truly understand the other, mm-hmm. right? Um, coming out is a very personal thing. And you would think if you're the most trusted human being in the world, in this person's life, that's the kind of thing they're going to hit you up with, like over a bagel in the morning. Right. So I have to say this, boom, right. Men or women, but it doesn't always work out that way. And this is all proven. Proven, you know, these are all proven psychological studies, psychiatric studies on how the brain works in these situations on both sides. The person closest to you suddenly becomes the person you're most person you're most afraid of. Yeah. Even though they you trust them more than anything. Well, because that person has the most significant capacity to right. hurt you. Right. Right? There's the most to lose there. Yeah. And and I get that. But then it's that, you know, the other side of there's nothing you could tell me that would make me think any different. Da, da, da. Especially when it's a lifelong friendship. Yeah. That, you know, but we also know there are things people can actually keep secret about their views, perceptions and stuff because it's happened. Yeah. Right. So I, I got it, but we had a, we had a nice long talk about this. And then, uh, you know, I thought that it was up to this point, it was done really well. And this, this, the stupid argument was just like, <laughs> I, it, it kind of showed how they're both so easily derailed. <laughs> yeah. From like the subject, you know, the topic at hand. Um, that's why I call it the stupid argument because it, was about nothing. It just was this thing. And they kind of like, they had to come back to it. But this really, to me, cemented the purpose of this film. Right. Cause this is what yeah. it's about. And I'm like, this nailed it without any extra bullshit. Bam. Now we're in it. 
Mm-hmm. So the next morning at breakfast, uh, Cassie has taken <laughs> all of the this. cereal. <laughs> Mackenzie goes to, she gets the, the box and it's empty and they cut over to Cassie who's behind her at the table. And she's got this mound of like Wheaties <laughs> in this cereal bowl. And she's just. It's so big. It's falling out of the bowl. Yeah. She goes to swim. <laughs> It's like a sandcastle coming apart. Like a cereal avalanche. It's fucking hilarious. So Mackenzie grabs this uh, big styrofoam thing of leftovers from the fridge. It's this big rice thing. I'm not sure what kind of fried rice of some sort. Something. Uh, so anyway, Cassie says she's not mad at Mackenzie. That Mac- she's not mad that Mackenzie is gay. She's mad that it was kept from her. Mackenzie talks about how hard it is to come out and that the hardest part was not being able to talk to her about it. And that was resonating right there. Yeah. You know, because they did have a lot of more mindless back and forth. And it's not, I'm not saying that is bad writing. It was actually an accurate representation of how quickly you can get off track into the most benign bullshit. (laughs) There's nothing to do with anything. Right. Yeah. But it comes back around that I thought was fantastic. Um, You know, the hardest part was not being able to talk to you about it. All this hard times I'm going through. I can't talk to you about it because you're the, the reason I'm, you know, you're the hard time. Right. <sighs> um, so ultimately they decide everything is going to be okay. And again, I like that. I like this whole dynamic from yeah. the night before till now is these kinds of friends, friendships, they do that. You can yeah. have the worst shit happen and just make fuck you, fuck off, go to hell. We're done. <laughs> give it some time oh my gosh yeah ah, we're okay or actually uh they decided that they will be right they're going to be that was the realistic part although i still love the the pettiness of yes (laughs) this giant cereal bowl that i know that that (laughs) it was unexpected and we both laughed out loud that was just (laughs) she because i thought oh Maybe Cassie emptied all the cereal because maybe she bought it or something. Because we didn't see her. Right. right. We see Mackenzie come in, do the thing. And then. No, she's just being petty and she wants Mackenzie to see her being petty. <laughs> yeah. And then so the camera pans and the table's behind Mackenzie. So they framed it perfectly. <laughs> and then there's Cassie with her mountain O. <laughs> it was some sort of flake thing, corn flakey thing. Yeah. But yeah. That's. <laughs> Okay. Um, later, Levi and Mackenzie are sitting on some steps on, on campus. And I love this part so much. <laughs> we, I, I think we both had so much fun with this. Yeah. He's pointing out who's gay and who is not. Uh, Cassie ends up joining them. Um, he's trying to train Mackenzie. Yeah, he's training Mackenzie. She's just terrible. She's like straight, 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 gay, gay, gay. He's like wrong in every count. Uh, and, and you know, um, so after Cassie joins them, the subject of Elliot comes up. And this is a woman that Mackenzie has been texting. We find out it's the woman that came up to her on the bench yeah. for her phone number that one time. And I just, there's a few more things that go on. It had us laughing. I just wrote, I love Levi's gaydar game so much. And she's so bad at it. And he is just super blunt. About <laughs> and that's what he even says. He's like, you know, I'm trying to, you know trying to train her on gaydar, raise her gaydar game. <laughs> kind of thing. And he's just like, oh, so yeah. disappointed. <laughs> She's hopeless. Oh, man. <sighs> so, um, so Cassie, learning about Elliot, says that Mac, uh, Mackenzie should invite her to their party on Saturday. And then later we have them both, uh, Cassie and Mackenzie, separately texting Levi about each other, bitching about each other. They have not been, get, despite saying that they're going to be okay, they haven't been getting along very well. Right. Right. Um, so then later the two of them are sitting on the couch. Cassie asks Mackenzie if she wants to get pizza and Mackenzie's like, oh no, I'm not very hungry. And then Elliot calls and Mackenzie is like, oh, my gosh, I'm starving. And Cassie's like, seriously? Yeah. Uh, So then we're at the night of the party and the party is hopping, more hopping than they anticipated it being. 
because Levi invited everyone, apparently. Uh, and then Matthew and his new girl show up. Yeah. Um, so I have to say, when I started taking my notes, I wrote they were at a party. I missed the bit where it was her party. Yeah, it's Cassie's there. party. Yes. And that's when Levi was, you know, like, hey, I invited everybody, this and that, don't hate me, and, you know, and then, oh, it's her party. That's what made this, to me, really weird. <laughs> Who invited this fucking guy? I don't know. Levi? No, see, he would Well, he's that. been trying to, like, call and text her throughout the movie, and she's been ignoring him. That's right, yeah. So, anyway. Yeah. So, it's possible that he heard about it and just invited his own self. Probably. Uh, Elliot is also there playing beer pong and uh, Mackenzie is too shy to talk to her. Right. And she's trying to talk to Cassie about it. And Cassie is too busy keeping an eye, an eye on Matthew. And, and so they're not woman. super connecting. <laughs> but then later we have them like they're all playing beer pong together um, with Elliot and Levi. And then while Cassie and Mackenzie are talking on the couch later, Matthew sits next to them. And Mackenzie leaves and finds Elliot in her room. And then she comes back to the couch and Elliot texts her asking if she wants to make out. And she leaves again. And Cassie's like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because she was going to go to the bathroom. Yeah. Um, so Cassie's sitting there wondering where Mackenzie is. And then Levi shows up on the couch. And he's just amazing. This, I love this. Go for it. So he has a little whispered conversation with Cassie, looks over at Matthew and the new, new girl and says to the girl, who the fuck are you? <laughs> she answers. She yeah answers her name, uh, Tasha. And he goes, I don't fucking care. I know. I, there is nothing we can do to describe Levi. <laughs> he, he was the clear standout. Yeah. In this, not the comedic relief. Uh, that's not because that's not what I mean. He's funny. But just everything about this guy was magnificent. I would have this guy as a friend. Levi would be in our circle 100 percent if he was out there somewhere nearby, you know. Oh, man. I just I yeah, <laughs> love him. Um, And then. Uh, they're discussing whether or not Mackenzie has diarrhea and Levi <laughs> decides this is too gross for him and goes and um, busts in on Mac in her room and sees what she, she's doing and is like, yeah, get it and leaves. Yep. Cassie has had enough of all of this <laughs> and goes outside and Matthew follows her. Uh, he tries to kiss her and she tells him to like, leave her alone. Meanwhile, uh, Mac is or Mackenzie. I call her Mac because sometimes they call her Mac. Yeah, and it's a lot shorter than go writing it. Mackenzie. Go for it. So this is when like Cassie really needs her. She's calling, and and Mackenzie's very busy. Yes. Uh so we see Cassie waiting on their bench alone because she had left a voicemail for Mackenzie to meet on their bench. She really needed to talk to her. Right. And the next day, Cassie's kind of cleaning up after the party. And Mac is telling Levi all about how it went with Elliot. Not well. <laughs> Mac is new to the, the concept of how to do lesbian sex. Yeah. Um, and Cassie could not be more disinterested. Right. In any of this. And uh, then Elliot calls and Mackenzie like goes to talk to her. And Cassie has a little conversation with Levi about how she is kind of jealous that Elliot is taking up all Mackenzie's time while her own life is falling apart. Right. Yeah. She wants her friend. Yeah. You know, to bounce off her misery. Yeah. Which I mean. I, I mean, that's part of the job. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the unspoken agreement between friends. I mean, that's literally what. Right. Therefore, you know, help get it out and maybe give some good advice, mostly just to listen to all the bullshit pour out. Right. Yeah. But at I mean, the same time, Mackenzie's in her own brave new world. 
right? Well, yeah. It's is it's it's um uh I, I, emotional and sexual freedom. Right. Right? Finally, the lid is off the box and she's like stepped into the world and is living as her. Yeah. So, yeah, that's that's of course that's going to take up. Yeah. You know. So then we have Cassie talking to her professor again about her very few prospects for the future. (laughs) Yes. I love, he's very blunt in his conversations with her. He he is. Uh, But he has suggested her for a job and gives her the contact info for the hiring manager. And it's a job that she's very interested in. So um, meanwhile, We have Elliot and Mac and Elliot's making fun of her for having the star stickers on her ceiling. Mackenzie is still very much like, uh, she's very childlike. Um, she is very much still a 16 year old. Yeah. That's how I read her. I got some things to say about that at the end. We had that discussion, but I'll come back to that. And then, um, they're going through Mackenzie's Tumblr and Mackenzie starts talking about her Tumblr girlfriend. Yeah. And Elliot's obviously not cool with this and leaves. And Mackenzie did not realize what a misstep that was. I know. And what made it seem more foolish, you know, her more foolish for the whole thing. So I don't know about you, but as soon as she said that, oh, it's my Tumblr girlfriend, I literally heard the squeaky rusty gates come slamming down yeah. with such speed that the, I heard the twisting of the metal. I was just like, oh, my God. I was like, oh, you're so dumb. And she is. Yeah, she's so oblivious to the whole. Yeah. Any of it. Yeah. I mean, but I think we've all been there. Like, not not there specifically. <laughs> but having done something, you know, or like you say something and you don't realize at all that it is something that has offended someone. Oh, I, I mean, that, that's part of life. But this, this is, I, this, me, is this, different. Is, this is way different. <laughs> this is like critical life skills. <laughs> it has a resounding F. Anyway, so Elliot leaves. She's pissed. Uh, and then Matt tries to call Cassie, who's in her interview for the job, and misses the calls. Right? Yeah. yeah. So Mackenzie tries to call Levi instead. <laughs> Go ahead. But he answers, and he's in the middle of having sex. And it's like, I can't talk right now. I'm having sex. And she's like, why did you answer the phone? Why did you even answer the phone? <laughs> what? So she tries Cassie again and has to leave a voicemail. Uh, So Cassie gets all the messages like an hour after this has all happened. Yeah, because she's done. Right. With the interview and stuff. Which, I mean, smart, mature thing to do. Yeah. Don't answer your phone in an interview. Right. Even if it is your best friend. On on behalf of the filmmakers and also Bravo for the B-side, little life advice. Yes. Turn that motherfucker off <laughs> <laughs> in an interview if you want the job. Yeah. So uh, we do have a scene of uh, Mackenzie eating ice cream alone on the bench. So we've had this on both sides, right? Where Cassie really needed Mackenzie. Mackenzie didn't, wasn't there for her. Right. And then Mackenzie needed Cassie and Cassie wasn't there for her. Right. Right. So later, they're arguing together in the apartment. Uh, Cassie is not interested in talking to Mackenzie about her problems because Mackenzie didn't help her with her problems earlier, right? And then they both decide to kind of air out everything that's irritating them about the other. Yeah. It's the, oh, you want to be honest? It's as soon as you hear that in an argument, you know that both people are going to say things that they regret later right oh you want me to be honest let's be honest oh we're being honest with each other yeah oh no uh yeah caveat you should always be honest with each other well i mean you should but but 
using the term honesty as a guise for saying things that are going to be hurtful. Right. I, I Isn't fair. I just uh, really has nothing to do with the movie, but I think just kind of this whole thing. I think there are little secrets in every relationship. Oh, sure. Like, for example, your best friends with somebody like I, you know, but I, I had, I'm not going to mention him by name, but one of my you know best friends and stuff for and into high school. Um, everything about him when he ate annoyed me to the point where I just wanted to stab him in the forehead with a fork. I mean, it was open mouth. It, it, it was literally like God designed him to push every button that he installed in me. I could never imagine a point where it would be beneficial to sit down and just like call him out on all of it. Cause it's right. Cause it's my choice here. Either shut the fuck up and deal with it. Cause this is your friend and this is how he is annoying or not, or whoosh, shut the door on this and move on. That's those are the only two choices. Yeah. Right. Um, so in these kinds of things, when, you know, oh, we're going to be honest with each other. It's not the little stuff like, I hate how you slurp noodles. It's not really about being <laughs> honest. It's not. It's about being vindictive and hurtful. Yeah. Um, but I think there's just little things that, that the greater good is not served. Right. By nitpicking. Because no. the whole point, uh, I mean, we, we both are very aware of the things that annoy us about one another. The little, little things. Oh, and we tell each other all the time. Well, we do. But, <laughs> but see, I guess it, it would never come out in a, oh, we're going to be honest. kind of. We never even had that like no. moment. But I guess we do it because we can, we know how to do it and we're comfortable doing it. And it's never spiteful or hurtful. It's right. You know, it's, uh, it's never meant to be hurtful. Right. And if it's taken hurtfully, we talk about that. Yeah, but mostly it comes out in in sort of a you know, it, it's like we have a, a small sitcom running sometimes. <laughs> These things just the way they come out works out. Um, but yeah, that was that was another gate that I heard and felt crashing when those words came out. Yeah. Oh no. Anyway. Anyway, really good writing for this argument. I I like I love this argument a lot. Oh, absolutely. So, yeah, they have this huge blow up argument. Um, they both think the other is self involved. And at the end of it, they've decided to end their friendship. Yeah. Uh, so, Mackenzie leaves and goes to Levi's. And again, I wrote Levi's awesome. Yes. Uh, they, they're chatting for a little bit. He asks how Cassie got the house and the divorce. Like, he's just. Like he's very supportive, but he's also very honest with her. Um, yeah, we'll talk more about Levi as as we after we get to the sword. But I just do just want to say this: this is yet another moment in a movie when it's nothing negative against the writing, the acting, the directing, anything. But I think for a full thirty seconds, nothing existed. Nothing it all existed for me except those fucking burritos they were eating. I, I was want one of those. I, 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 I just, it was, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I completely dislodged from reality and note taking until finally I was able to write those burritos look fucking awesome. They do look really good. They were hypnotically good. Yeah. So I want to know where. Well, they looked about as good as the one that you got from Global Market that one time, which looked like a really awesome burrito. It was a really awesome burrito. But God, <laughs> those, I don't know. There's just something about living in a grungy inner city apartment yeah. <laughs> and a nearby burrito shop. These things were just, They're huge I'm sorry. And delicious. I things. had to pay homage to the burrito because it will not come up again ever after this. Yeah. So there we go. I get it. So he is supportive with for Mackenzie for a while, but he also is like uh, telling her, I'm going out tonight. And she's like, oh, I want to go with. And he's like, no, <laughs> it's not for you. Oh, yeah, that was one of the best. He has so many good lines. A lot yeah. of his stuff is like spot on. Yeah. He's like, well, what, what did he say? 
Well, it's him and his gay friends. And yeah, she's right. like, I'm gay. And he's like, no, no you're, you're no. a lesbian. And she's like, well, what's the difference? And he just goes, <laughs> like a, like he's actually entertained, but also I feel a little sorry for you. Mm-hmm. And then just gets up and leaves. Yeah. All right. Uh, so after the uh, awesome fucking burrito scene, um, Cassie's on the phone, ends up being Matthew. Uh, he comes over, they hop right into bed. Uh, Mackenzie, at the same time, is going to go see Elliot. A uh, little contrast here. Um, you know, Cassie is fucking Matthew. Elliot is not in the least bit interested in hearing anything Mackenzie has to say. Nope. And again, I guess we can call this part out a little bit. I thought that was brilliant because it didn't make Elliot look like a bitch. It just made her. Right. Okay. Because we're all entitled to make and encouraged. We encourage people to make these choices in life. Yeah. When something happens, right, that's negative, cut that shit loose. If you're just dating someone for like three months and then the, 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 Tumblr girlfriend thing pops up, something that magnitude of just absolute emotional immaturity yeah. and, it's, and it's hurtful. You know what? You just shut the fucking door and move on. This is, yeah. Okay, after 25 years of marriage, something like this happens, you probably want to sit down and have a conversation, talk <laughs> to the counselor and stuff, right? Because there's a lot going on here. Now, people grow apart and that shit happens. But after a few weeks, a couple months, no, no. There's, you know what? Life's too short. Yeah. That. So I didn't think Elliot, the way it was portrayed, was at all being, in fact, she was like trying to be very gentle. Yeah. You know, instead of like, just shut the fuck up. Yeah. Right. She just, you know, because, you know, and Mackenzie, this is the kind of thing that we're going to touch on. She's still acting like a 16 year old. Yeah. Right. <gasps> Maybe I could just come in and <sighs> explain. And, uh, you know, and Elliot's like a full on adult. Yeah, well, it's like, no, no, <laughs> you know, and is very sweet and polite about it, but ultimately shuts the door on it, mm-hmm. literally. Yeah. Um, so uh, after we cut back to Cassie after sex, she just like kicks Matthew out, basically saying, so this is just a booty call. You need to go. Yeah. I thought, you know what? Good for you. I get it. These things happen, especially when you don't have a friend. Yeah, things going on with your friend on top of all the other stuff and all this and that, you know, sometimes it's just like, you know what? I just, I just want to have like sex and just, that's it. Right. Because that isn't related to anything that's going on. It's my thing right now. Right. Right. It's, it's like sitting down with a, with a bag of Milky Ways. I'm just going to eat these one after the other till the bag is gone. And your brain focuses on that and it pulls you away from it. You don't even think about it. Well, it is. It's junk food. And you know that it's not good for you, but you're like, I don't care. But when it's done, it's done. And that's the thing. I credit Cassie, that character, for that moment of, nope. Yeah. You know, and what gets me is Matthew's like, oh. I I, I never, I did, I still don't understand this, this line. But I get it because I'm, I've known these fucking people. He, she tells him to get out. It was a booty call. And he looks at her and he's like, I have a girlfriend. Right. Like, like I have a relationship and I cheated on her to fuck you. That's got to be worth something. Right. What? <laughs> oh, I know. Man. I, 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 we'll, we'll I was talk like, about yeah, great. Then. Go back to her. God, yeah. So anyway, she kicks his ass out. And as he's leaving, I love this. Um, <laughs> Mackenzie storms into the apartment yelling, I'm only coming back because I need more underwear. Yes. <laughs> Vanishes off camera, comes back on, goes out. And then she's like, no, no, something about it. Oh, that's 33 pair. That should be enough. No, it, it or, turned out she didn't have any more underwear. She- oh, was that what it was? <laughs> yeah. So I didn't realize I didn't have that many <laughs> pairs of underwear. That, okay, that was it. Yeah. So, so then she's gone. Uh, and then we're another day. Uh, Cassie is meeting with her future boss. And then we see her texting her mom that she got the job and is moving to New York City. And her mom's and response we, is like, who is this? Yeah. God, poor Cassie. Goddamn. 
I felt more sorry for her than anybody because uh, the horrible parent thing. Yeah. Just awful. So later, uh, Levi and Cassie are having a drink. Uh, Cassie says she's not telling Mackenzie she's moving because Mackenzie didn't tell her that she was gay. And he just flat out tells her that you should be in each other's lives until one of you dies. Yeah. Right. This, he is like the, just the no bullshit. He, you can tell he has been what they're going through. Doesn't come close to what he went through. And he touches on it when he jokes, you know, yeah, they called me an abomination that set the tone for how his relationship in life went after he came out. Yeah. And then you can only imagine prior to that, because he, he is a very feminine guy, right? He has a lot of soft trills and drops and stuff. And even though he's, you know, a little bit bigger, he carries himself. So I was thinking, God, not only, you know, we're coming out, that he's, was the whole thing. I'm pretty sure. He's a hundred footer. He's a hundred footer. Right. But I'm pretty sure he was under scrutiny and criticism from his parents just for how he was. Right. Um, that's a whole conversation. Uh, but anyway, uh, I just, yeah. I love the development of him. He's tired of being the middleman between them too. He, yeah. Well, yeah. The texting when they're going back, yeah. he actually fucked up and he's like, what? One of them's like, what? He's like, oh, sorry, wrong conversation. <laughs> and then says the same thing to the, but he tells her point blank. He's tired of being the middleman. Mm-hmm. Um, and I love this. He's like, okay, you've got, you know, what else is there? You've got like three minutes. Cause I have to go out. She's like, you're going out. It's 11 o'clock. He's like, okay, grandma. I know. I know <laughs> Okay, Grandma. And this actor, I don't know if he's like a stand-up guy or something, like, you know, amateur level and stuff, but he is just every, I don't know too many people in the, in, in the A-list who could hit beats, timing like him. That was just, that. it just, I love this movie so much. We're almost done talking about it, but I love it so much because multiple times it made us burst out laughing. <laughs> and, and Levi, every time. That was time, one of those, okay, Grandma. Yeah. Uh, Levi every time, but uh, uh, the two leads also had had some good moments, but this was really done well. So anyway, uh, Mackenzie is at her computer and she's going through, she ends up stalking Elliot, you know, that whole thing, and sees that Elliot's posts, uh, she has a new girlfriend. So then she starts to call or text. She, just, she starts looking up Cassie. I don't know if she's going to call her or text her. Mm-hmm. Then she stops and then she starts looking up apartments. And then she finds out her apartment. Right. Is up for rent. Is up for rent. Slash Cassie's apartment. Yeah. So Cassie's packing. Mackenzie comes in. Um, well, it's funny because Cassie's packing. And I love this little moment. Uh, Cassie's holding up a shirt that Mackenzie got her. And look, and she's like, how did I not know? Right. right? So she's realizing she should talk to Mackenzie and she's about to leave to go and do that. Yeah. She picks up her keys just as Mackenzie comes in. Yeah. Yeah. And what I like about this, I'm not going to get into the specifics of it, but this, uh, I just summed it up as they both find a touch of being an adult. Yeah. Right. And this whole situation elevates to another level where they make sincere apologies. Right. And accept them, you know, at an adult level, they, this, it's it's extremely different from the last time. Last couple times, they mm-hmm. tried to have a conversation, and everything was okay, quote unquote. Um, anyway, we get uh, a super that says one year later, uh, Mackenzie's in an apartment. She's with someone. Well, she's in their apartment, but it's redecorated. Oh, was it? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then we cut to Cassie, who is banging someone in the back seat of a car. <laughs> And uh, her and the guy uh, let us know that they're late for something. Yeah. And, and then. And Mackenzie and her girlfriend are also late for something. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so then we see uh, 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 Cassie and her partner uh, pull up to Mackenzie and her partner in another car. So long story short, they're, they're meeting like in between or. One or the other. Yeah, so. they're just meeting up with each other. Yeah, they're they're doing what grown ups do. 
you move apart. And if you're close enough, you every couple of weeks or so, you know what, let's meet and have lunch. Let's go hang for the day, something, you know, or go take turns visiting. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, you know, it's like you have friends or 40 minutes to an hour, depending on weather. Yeah. <laughs> and which, we which meet up occasionally. Yeah. You know, but there's always the texting and stuff. Yeah. It's always good to have that physical thing. We have a very long and very weird text chain. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, uh, that's a whole different podcast really <laughs> um so that that uh, and then the credits roll that is in essence almost adults yeah um i i don't know how to honor this movie any more than just simply saying i loved it I loved it also the the one thing that i came to you let's just get this out of the way that i could even remotely categorized as a criticism in the very beginning, Mackenzie bugged me because she was so young. And I explained that to you as she's just like two. And I didn't think, you know, frame it at the time, but like I said, she's like 16. You know? Right. And not a, not a worldly 16 year old. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, I'm talking about 16. Uh, who's maybe one, two months out of the playing with Barbie's phase. It's just, it was so cute. So I just explained, it's just, it's like so young, young. And here's the thing. It's not because I'm a hundred years old. No, it's because you were, you know, like 30 when you were 15. Oh, even basically. before that, I explained, I'm like, God, yeah, I was like 32 when I was seven. Yeah. I never, never had that phase. Now, I know my friends did, right? But just my interpretation of everything, my view of everything and how I approached everything was old man from, you know, day one. My grandfather started working on me like day one when I was born. I know. You were born 88. I was. By the time time I was four, I was already done (laughs) with it. And that's when the frustration of what is this bullshit? This is this kindergarten. You fucking kidding me? You know? And I think I mentioned it on here once that I did get suspended from kindergarten for three days for swearing because it wasn't, it wasn't what we called the Carlin seven. I had all the good words by kindergarten. Yeah. My grandfather was a master swearer. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and on the other hand, I like didn't have that issue because I did go through this, you know, I had, um, I told you I had, Someone who is very similar to Levi, who was my best, best, best friend. Yeah. And we were attached at the hip and we did everything together. And it was our late teens, early 20s when, you know, time doesn't matter. When you go to sleep doesn't matter. How often you eat doesn't matter. You just do whatever you want. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the thing. I was Levi. You be young and free and have fun. He sees things, how I perceive him. Like I said, he's... He approaches these two women with a whole, like, like 25 more years of life on him, even though they're all the same age. You just, you look at him, you're like, this is a guy, it just in the way he, he holds himself, the way he speaks. He's wise beyond his years. He's, he's lived, he's lived a very different life and a lot of it in a short period of time. You just get that. So I was like him to my friends, you know, I was the one who was, you know, sometimes not as um, delicately as he did, <laughs> you know, saying shit straight, but yeah, it's, it's a very different way to perceive things. But anyway, I sorted it through because, you know, again, it, it made sense. It just, it was like a lot. It was the whole montage thing. It was oh, just like, sure. you know, it was right at the beginning. It was like a lot, but then, you know, started soaking in, like, okay, I can't identify with it, but take that step back. It's like, okay, so this is what I did see in a lot of my circle. Sure. Right? Because, you know, yeah. Um, that's really, that's really it. That's like the only bad moment. It wasn't really bad. It was just adjusting mm-hmm. kind of thing. For me, about this entire movie, that and... When Cassie's mom, you know, are you a lesbian? 
Like that's the only reason she could have possibly left Matthew. I it, it, there's so much to that. There's so many layers. I don't know how much we'll get into because we're you know talking about the movie. But yeah, well, just I'll I'll just wrap my little opening bit up with this is a movie. I don't know if it was ever on a playlist. Like this should be like Pride Month. This should be in like a top twenty movies to watch. So that's my pseudo negative take, which wasn't really negative. Just sure. Yeah. I get it. Uh as far as lessons for this movie, I think it's kind of endless. Uh one I do want to bring up that doesn't necessarily have to do with the um like the film itself, but it has to do with crowdfunding. Yes. Is you know, if you want an example of a movie that was crowdfunded successfully, go check out the Kickstarter page for this movie. Because I checked it out when we were doing our research about, you know, right. our our little factual information we put at the beginning <laughs> of each episode. There it goes. I booped it, booped the mic. <laughs> it's been such a long couple of days. I know. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, the Kickstarter for this was done very well, very professionally. Uh, they leveraged their followers on um, on their their channel. They put together videos. They explained like they're very transparent about everything they were doing. Uh, and the vibe of the Kickstarter had the vibe that the movie would have, you know, later. And their stretch goals were appropriate, like. Wow, we're surprised that we raised enough money to make the movie. Hey, how about you help us raise more money for post-production, which is really important also. And, right. you know, uh, I would highly suggest going and looking at the Kickstarter as an example of a successfully funded film because it's a really good example of one. I, I think, too, it's it's important to realize the power of of putting a YouTube page up. Yeah. Having your social media. I can't stand any of it, but we do it. Right? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, granted, so like our YouTube for the podcast is literally just the podcast in video form. We get almost nobody, but we get a few followers and, you know, up and down, up and down, up and down. But the whole point is it's there. It's a presence. Right. Right. You have to have a presence. The uh, BF McGillicuddy you know, that's um, going to be kicking off this week. Because yep. now we don't have a small person to entertain <laughs> every night. So we can throw all that shit up and do some recording. Yes. You know, I'm going to do like, got three or four to go. But I, my goal is to do like five or six in one shot. Mm -hmm. And then just edit them and release them weekly. But anyway, one... It's something I, you know, it's kind of a fun thought and everything, but also it's a way to get another presence out there for the time when we want to leverage something. Now, I'm very certain we don't have anywhere near the followers they did. Oh, no. <laughs> They've been at it for a while. And we're still fairly new at it. And I, I don't sweat it. I don't care, you know, how many we do or don't have. It's just like we're doing it and one day it'll, you know. We started at zero for the podcast. We're doing pretty good weekly, you know, it's nowhere near making money <laughs> and all that, but um, it just takes time. Yes. So filmmakers, you need to do this. You need to even if, and we thought about doing another small podcast on the writing yeah. now that we're finally fucking back into it <laughs> and just in like five, 10 minutes, even. I mean, BF McGillicuddy is about five minutes or less, right? Right. Because that's all it is. It's just a thought that I had, you know, if you were an alien, what would you think of this fucking planet? Because I have a hard time. I can't imagine somebody who doesn't have the info looking at all the shit going on, trying to figure it out. Um, it doesn't need to be any big thing. You know, whether people will listen to it or not, I don't know. I don't care, but it's out there. And if you get a few, that's a few more than you would have had going in this blind. The other thing is, like you said, stretch goals. Yeah. Take a look at someone who did succeed. Did I mean, they kicked this thing's ass. Oh, yeah. Right? And you can tell in the production that the quality 
everything about this is super professional, straight on, no indie sacrifices. And we've talked about it. You have to sacrifice lighting. You have to sacrifice location. You have to sacrifice a lot of shit because you don't have the money. That's indie film. Well, and that's the other thing is that this wasn't their first foray into filmmaking, right? They have the Gay Women Channel. They've made tons of shorts. Exactly. Little videos. Yes. They have a lot of experience with this stuff. Yeah. Right? Well, Hilton was making shorts. Yeah. And that's how Zombie with a Shotgun came because he made it a web series. Mm -hmm. And then had enough people and said, hey, I'm going to make a film out of this. And they all, you know, stepped up. It right. helped make it happen. But I want to go back to with the whole stretch goal thing. Um, a lot of times Kickstarters or Indiegogo, anything will go to get movie to make the film. Right. And then, and we know this because Kyle Hester is doing it with Preacher Six. They shot it. Now they need, they're, they're raising money for post. Mm-hmm. Post is such a nightmare. A post is the part that literally no one looks forward to when making a movie. <laughs> no. Um, and I get it. You know, as from the writing standpoint, one's the same as the other to me. You know, it, once the writing is actually done, you know, let's, you know, someone else is doing this, someone else is doing that, making a movie. But as a director, you're all, you're doing all the stuff, right? Yeah. It's the filmmaking. And then that all's done. Now it's sitting at your desk. <laughs> staring at your monitor or monitors yeah, and watching shit over and over and over. It's the least collaborative, least fun part. Right. I and mean, in my opinion, other people might think differently, but in my opinion and what I've experienced from others who have relayed their opinions. Well, I think for like an editor, someone who wants to be an editor, for them, it's exciting. Sure. Because that's their thing. Right. And that's where a lot of indie films aren't able to hire an editor. It's the director who's doing it. Right. David Ryan Keith, he'll always be our example of, you know, this man put so much heart and soul into his shit post production. And he just hates it. (laughs) He gets so fed up with it. And, and I get it. Um, Have that in mind, you know, use this Kickstarter as an example. I think that's excellent lesson. Oh, well, thank you. Oh, certainly. Hmm. Do you have a lesson? Uh, I, I'm going to go, there's, there's a lot. But I think most importantly, I'm going to go with write what you know. We've talked about this. Yeah, where, that's a good one. You know, it's always good to get out of your wheelhouse. Write a script about something that you're not comfortable with, right? But you have to know it. Do the research. Yeah. Right? We've talked about so many things that we've watched they clearly had no fucking clue about any of this stuff. It's like, just because your uncle had an army surplus store that went out of business. So you've got, you know, BDUs and stuff, you know, from modern times back to world war two, right. That does not qualify you to make a war film. Right. Just because you've got the dress up. You, right. you, you need to know stuff. You need to get, you know, people who, who have served and can tell you, how things run, the terminology that they use. This is how this would happen. This is how this would happen. It's just like, you can't have like a giant 25 person lightsaber fight with everybody just fucking about with Nerf lightsabers. You have to have someone come in who's a choreographer to uh, choreography, choreograph the battles. Right. Right. That's why we have stunt people because most A-list actors are just too valuable to put out there and risk getting their skull crushed. Because they're trying to do in a couple of weeks what this guy has spent years learning to do. Yes. Write what you know. And this is a clear example of it. Everything about this. From the, the surface level friendship stuff all the way down to this. This is like the trifecta of life fucking you over. And it happens to every one of us. Identity. Yeah. What do I want to be? So like who I am now. Yeah. Right. And that has nothing to do with anything else other than uh, like, am I, you know, a life lister or am I just a do it kind of thing? What the fuck do I want to do? Sexuality. Whether or not you're grappling with, with being gay or lesbian or trans or anything, even straight people, all of us hit that level where we have to figure it out for ourselves. 
And that could be what we were raised to believe. Right. What's taboo? What's good? What's bad? What makes you, you know, sick? What makes you burn in hell? You know, there's a lot of stuff out there for every human being to be. Well, and even just getting past that stuff, like what, what you're into, right? Well, that's just it. You, well, you have to figure out all that shit first before you can start thinking about what you're into because you're right away, you know, up against that wall of, you know, that's terrible. That's heinous and disgusting and, you know, it's inhuman. It, it's just a form of fucking, I mean, <laughs> you know. Well, you even if there isn't like that. that, you know, that, you know, very, very aggressive anti-sexual stuff going on, there's also just the like, uh, the the societal taboo of oh that's weird right well uh, that's the next phase of it yeah that's a huge part I mean it's it's terrible to to lump it into one bucket I know it's a big bucket folks big <laughs> it's bucket. got a lot of compartments so all of that shit trying to figure it out in addition to the not so common friendship to people going through all this stuff and the issue of coming out. You know, are you hurt or do you understand? Do you tell them or are you afraid? It's that whole thing. And I don't think there's a right or wrong. Well, I think it was very artfully done for both of the main characters in here who both saw significant character growth throughout the movie. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And, you know, where they ended up isn't where they thought they would be, but they're in a good place, right? And that speaks a lot to... Uh, the writing, how the story was structured, mm-hmm. you know, the even down to the actors they picked for the film. Like, there's just so many. It's there hard is. to pick out little. Yeah, but lessons. you zero it back down. They wrote what they knew. Yeah. They know this. They yeah, know they're this. They're clearly. <laughs> so they, they put it on paper and then made a film out of it. And I, I love that. The actors were fantastic. Um, all of them. It's just Levi was the standout because yeah. he's like here a little bit, there a little bit. And every fucking second on screen was 100% maximized <laughs> for him. I don't think this would have been the same movie if it had been written or directed by a man. No, that let's go back to that. So um, I think I can write emotionally wrenching things, but from an overarching thing. Sure. Okay? So I'm going to like, you know, chapter 10, in the novel that I wrote the death of one of the characters uh, to me is, is one of the finest things I've written. And I think it hits all the chords. It just makes you feel sick. Right. And it's not grotesque or anything. It's just, it's, you know, um, it's tragic on how it happens. But when you're talking about emotion from within the person, yeah. I think women, I've said that how many times? Women do it better than men. We can write tragedy, but women can do it from an internal to outward, you know, perspective. It, it, it would. It would have been a completely different. It would have, it probably would have sucked. Mm-hmm. I, I think of this, and I've been doing this lately. What about this movie shows me it's a woman's perspective? What shows me that a woman's writing went into this, the mindset, the, the, the things that are happening, how would I see it differently or would I have written it the same? A lot of times would have written it the same because they're external things. Right. But yeah, there's those moments where it's like, and especially the friendship between women, two young women. Yeah. There's, um, it's a, it's a completely different dynamic. It is. It's a male, female sexuality identity has nothing else to do with it. It's a completely different dynamic. And from a man's perspective, there's not a whole lot to write about. There's <laughs> not a whole lot to touch on. Well, that's the thing. Like my my text strings, right, with Carla and Ashley, my my girl, girl, girl friendships. Yeah. I tell you about some of the things we talk about and you're like, what? 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 And a lot of times they fucking crack me up. So I just, <laughs> I just... I don't know where it came from. I don't know where it's going, but just as an outsider, I'm like, oh my God. Yeah. It's oftentimes more, more crass and wildly specific than you would think. A little bit. Yeah. But you got to remember having 
had the benefit of being raised by mostly women, surrounded mm-hmm. by women. Um, I get it, but I still, again, I will never presume to be able to be inside the head of a woman in any situation. And that's where I defer to you when we write. And if I was doing something else that I needed an experience, I would reach out to, to a, you know, a woman who, okay, so here's the situation, this and this. Can you help me see? Yeah. Right. Tell me how you see, perceive, or dealt with this kind of thing. And then I would use that to, you know, build something with. But um, even then it's secondhand. Right? Yeah. And that's why women will always be better at this kind of thing. Um, and I always, too, I get a little, little heavy in the heart watching things like this, thinking that these two women who made this movie, how much of this did they go through? How much worse was it? Because that's the other thing, too, right? Yeah. You know, they could write a thing. Sometimes it's like, this would be hard, but God, I wish mine was this easy. Well, that's the thing, right? like, uh, you know, pain plus time equals comedy. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, do you have any specific lessons? Not really. I mean, I like just kind of overall the dialogue was really good. The writing was really good. It was smart that they used um a minimal number of locations and the minimal number of characters. Yes. Um without needing to go too far into all of that, right? Right. Um I, like color wise and and tone wise the music and the and the color and the lighting and just the you know the palette of this movie was all very appropriate right the the tempo forget the subject matter and everything the tempo of the writing i thought was nice and even yes there were no like dips or like a sudden valley and then a, a lull yeah, I mean, there was no point at which we were like, okay, move the story along. You right. Know. Where we've had that. <clears throat> or or alternatively, and we've also had this, where we're like, hold on. Yeah. Wait a minute. What? <laughs> What's going on? Yeah. Um, yeah. So watch this film. Uh, the whole thing is another... Another giant class of lessons. Pay attention to the lighting. Pay attention to the subject matter. Pay uh, actors. Pay attention to the delivery of these people, because we do see Mackenzie go from, you know, acting like she's sixteen to creeping into adulthood. Yeah. Right. Um, and the the actor did a fantastic job with the face, because words mean nothing if you don't have a face behind it. Mm-hmm. So did well. The music was appropriate. It had all kinds, all kinds. And you could tell it was indie music because guess what? Indie film can't do. Can't pay for big music licenses. Big music licensing. Yeah. So, you know, you might learn some new music tastes. Sure. That was that was good with all that they had. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Um costuming and so on. So we have these limited locations. We get the idea of Cassie and her parents that helped present it, but Cassie dresses better than Mackenzie. Yes. She very much is like her mother's daughter in terms of how I look, even on like sluffy days, right? Right. She just looks better. Mackenzie is a hot fucking mess. She is just a fashion wreck, even for casual. She's sloppy. If you said, you know what, put on your favorite sweatpant outfit to just lounge on the couch for two days, she, she'd bomb that too. She just, <laughs> she just isn't hitting the marks at all. Um and that's just completely, you know, diametrically opposed to Cassie. But that helped establish them. Oh, Levi. Yeah. Levi, you just, the first time you see his face, you know who he is and where he's coming from. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's the art of costuming. Yeah. It doesn't cost much. Well, right? yeah. I mean, there's a moment where he's sitting with Mackenzie on the couch and he crosses his legs and you see these fabulous, like, uh, chunky heels he's wearing oh my god the the five or six inch platforms yeah yeah and i was just like yes queen or they're like um i know (laughs) i think they were like four or five inch platforms and then and then it was a heel that had to be like seven inch and this is a big dude (laughs) he's not you know he's he's not my height yeah he's a tall man yeah and then when he gets up and you hear (laughs) you're like those are some heavy shoes. 
<laughs> these aren't those plastic heel platforms that no, he means it. Yeah, I know. And he pulled it off. I mean, that's another thing. It's has nothing to do with anything other than the person wearing the stuff. Levi sold it every bit. You can sell anything if you're confident enough. And he was. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I can't think of anything else to single out. It's all good. I think we mentioned the high notes. Yeah. Well, then at this point, we can mention where we have some high notes. Our website, lordsmisrealproductions.com. We got everything there. We got a blog. We got a merch store. We got a Patreon link. We got uh, links to all of our past episodes. And actually, I think you just listen on the site to our past episodes. Yeah. Everything's on there. Yeah. The whole thing's there. Yeah. And our platform links to all. Yeah. Social media. Also. Yeah. Where you can listen to our podcast. Every, everything is on there. Also our contact information. If you want to contact us, do you have something you want us to cover? We're cool with that. Yeah. Or, you know, you're working on something. Introduce yourself. You know, that's why we're here. Yeah. Or have we talked about something that you've done and you want to talk to us about it? Yeah. We're open to that, man. As we say, when you're on one of our social medias, see who we're following and who's following us. Check them out. That's your tribe, people. Mostly. There's a few, like, weirdly associated accounts that I follow because, you know, I mean, it's still our account. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You know, but for the most part, um, God, yeah, everybody who has a presence that we've interviewed, we follow. Uh, and you can do that too. You can go through our past episodes on any platform or just do it on the website. Scroll down. You can see all the interviews. Uh, mm-hmm. Check all the names. Check these people out. Listen to the interviews. The reason we interview these people is because they're fucking fascinating. Yeah. They're awesome. You know, not just because they're they cool talk to us, which is kind of it too. But luckily, every single one of them is interesting. <laughs> you know, we don't have a guy who just made a McDonald's commercial and was like, yeah, I'll talk to you. Yeah. You know. I mean, we'll still talk to him, but that's not how we respond to it. I went to school with a kid who was in a McDonald's commercial. Did you? Yeah. Do you remember it was like in the in the nineties, the commercial with all the kids and they it was like they were introducing the big kids meals. And so they had all these kids in high chairs and the kids took the tray off the high chairs and threw them and they were like Yes. Okay. A kid I went to school with was the main kid in that commercial, like really? the one in front of, yeah. Ah, small world. The more you know. There you go. He de- <laughs> I, to my knowledge, he never did anything after that. Well, and that also happens. That's fine. The commercial kid. Yeah. And then that's it. He was very photogenic. <gasps> All right. Okay. Well, yeah. until next time. Yeah. Uh, keep at it, folks. We keep love you. It. Okay. Why does that throw you every time? Because, <laughs> because the way you look at me, you know you're doing it to catch me <laughs> when I'm saying something. <laughs> See. <laughs> anyway, oh. uh, B siders, keep doing your thing. Find your tribe. Lots of things out there. Reach out to us. We'll we'll throw you in in the mix. You know. Um, be good to one another, support one another, and, you know, let's keep those B-movies and indie films alive. Um, keep doing your thing. And uh, with that, till next week. This is Danny. And this is Jim. Bye. Bye.